have you all back and, and engaged. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Claudia Hammond, Akiko Hart, uh, Catherine Roche, Harry Sewell and Norman Lamb, who will join us in conversation and panel discussion, picking up on core themes from the conference and looking forward to what we can do. Um, your engagement throughout the conference has been absolutely wonderful. And I'd just like to ask uh, one last time, if when we're finished with the conversation, if you could just stay around for a little bit longer so that we can round up and provide details of how we can all uh, remain engaged. But for now, it's my pleasure to introduce Claudia Hammond, who will in turn introduce and chair our panel this afternoon. Claudia, I, who I'm sure is well known to many of you, is an award-winning broadcaster, author, and psychology lecturer. She's a visiting professor of the public understanding of psychology at the University of Sussex and presenter of several podcasts and radio shows, including All in the Mind on uh, BBC Radio 4, which covers psychology, neuroscience, and mental health, and a weekly global health show, uh, Health Check on BBC World Service. Claudia also writes a regular column on medical myths for BBC Future, a latest book, The Art of Rest, which examines the science behind our struggles to relax and uh, rest, particularly relevant in these challenging times, uh, has recently been published. And she's also the author of Mind Over Money, Time Warped, and Emotional Roller Coaster. So Claudia, delighted you could join us and chair this afternoon's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, um, and thank you so much for inviting me. Hello, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here at a conference on such a crucial topic. Uh, we've got a great panel and we've got almost an hour to discuss a lot of the themes that I know have been coming up over the last couple of days. And we want to focus on what can actually be done next, what can be done right now to start to improve mental health in the future. So partly I'll be asking the panel for their thoughts, but we very much want to hear your questions. I've got those that you've already sent in, so thank you very much for those, but do add more questions um, in the chat if you want to. There are various themes which I'm sure we're going to discuss as we go along. Um, such as poverty, other sorts of disparities, resilience, and also the policies that can make a difference in practice. So don't worry if you're asking a question now, it may well come up later because we're sorting those into themes as we go. But uh, let me introduce our, our panel. We've got a really great panel today. Uh, we have Akiko Hart, who is the CEO of the National Survivor User Network. Um, she's previously worked as the Hearing Voices Project Manager at Mind in Camden and as Director of Mental Health Europe. Um, and she's a trustee of many places, including the English Hearing Voices Network and National Voices. Thank you for joining us, Akiko. Um, Sir Norman Lamb is also joining us, who is now the chair of the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, um, was of course health minister from 2012 to 2015, has been a campaigner for, I think it's fair to say decades now, um, and as a minister introduced the first access and waiting time standards in mental health care for difficulties such as depression, anxiety, and a first episode of psychosis. Um, and his knighthood in 2019 recognized his public and political service and his contrib contribution to mental health in particular. And we're also lucky to have Harry Sewell, who has a lot of experience, a wealth of experience in operational and strategic leadership in health and social care. A social worker by background uh, with nearly 30 years experience, he's held all sorts of different senior roles within social care and the NHS in central government, regional services and local services. Um, and he's the founder and director of HS Consultancy, um, but he is also a writer and a speaker, I'm sure many of you will have come across in his specialist area of social justice, equalities and ethnicity, race and culture in mental health. He's also senior visiting fellow at the University of Central Lancashire, so welcome to you too. And we're not only focusing on adults, children's well-being is of course crucial and has long-lasting effects as, as I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about in the last couple of days. Catherine Roach is the chief executive of Place to Be, the well-known children's charity work which works in schools with children and teachers and families to improve mental health and the organisation has grown a lot um, in her time there. Uh, she started out as a secondary school teacher before completing an MBA and working in consultancy. So welcome to all four of you. Um, we have a lot to um, talk about. Uh, anyone who wants to start in the audience who wants to start putting any questions into the chat as they come to you, do feel free to. But I'd like to start by asking each of you, what would you like to see done in society right now, as we hopefully emerge soon from the pandemic, in order to improve mental health in the future? Um, let's start with Jordan. Ka Catherine, what would you say? Uh, well, in the world of children, I would love to see mental health embedded within school communities. 
um, support that is well, firstly promoting positive mental health. We're going to come on to resilience, but building children's resilience um, and then being able to intervene early, identify and address children's problems early on. Um, and that, that approach needs to include support and work with the staff in the school, with parents, and it would be great to see a great joined up system, if that's not too much to ask. Health and education, social care, all working hand in hand. Great, thank you for that. And uh, Harry, what would you say? For me, the priority would be to see an investment in changing the dialogue around what mental health is. I think whilst we consider it to be a pathology inside people's heads, and that's the dominant discourse, we continue to passport the problems in society onto psychiatry as a discipline. So changing the narrative, um, which is what we're kind of starting to do here, but a massive investment in that would then open lots of conversations about the traumas people face in their everyday lives. And so how would you go about doing that in practice? If, if, you, if you could have this massive investment, how would that investment change things? What would you actually do to change the narrative? I would include, so for all services who provide direct services in a crisis, I would equitably match the funding so that they can do work in preventative but not just in the kind of traditional public health preventative model, but in the kind of restructuring of society in the way that I spoke about. So that's how I do it, because the people who are providing direct services have a lot of insight into the consequences of social inequalities. So therefore, they might be best placed to then articulate what needs to be done on the ground. Akiko, that sounds, sounds very much like your area. What, what would you say needs to be done? Yep, very much agree with what Harry said. Um, so I think one of the challenges we face here is how, how broad, how unhelpfully broad the term mental health is. It covers children and young people, older people, veterans, um, the general population. It's an incredibly um, wide policy waterfront. And I think what tends to get oxygen, what tends to get funding is dictated by what feels um, most deserving, um, what feels easiest to understand. Um, what feels easiest to fix. And of course, that creates and exacerbates um, huge inequalities within the field. So I think from my perspective, the single most important thing we could do in the UK right now um, in mental health would be reforming um, welfare and social security. So quite specifically, for example, extending the universal credit uplift to legacy disability benefits, more broadly removing sanctions um, and conditionality, and kind of looking at how um, the welfare system is currently um, punitive and, and creates in itself, I think, anxiety, shame and distress. And this, I think, is super tricky because we tend to think in silos, don't we? So that in the UK, that reads as a DWP, a Department of Work and Pensions argument, as opposed to a health, a Department of Health and Social Care one. And it's really politically unpopular because it's become a really divisive issue in this country for a number of reasons. So I think it's a really good example um, of where if, if, if all the players in mental health coalesced around this issue, I think you might see some traction that's not happening because it's seen as out of scope, it's seen as difficult and it's seen as political. So Norman, what, what would you say? Is, is it possible to do something that is seen as political and seen as out of scope? You of course have had a go at doing this as, as health minister. Well, I think you face the prospect of violent agreement uh, on this panel uh, in many respects, because I totally agree with the points that have been made. What, I, um, what I'm conscious of is that over the last 10 years or so, we have made quite a lot of progress in terms of sort of uh, getting mental health uh, out into the open, uh, accepted, talked about, harder to ignore. But the default position too often is treatment services. You know, it, it, uh, the, the solution is to invest more money in treating people. Uh, and this goes directly to Harry's point. Uh, we need to focus far more of our attention on how we prevent mental ill health in the first place. And that goes to the social determinants of health. And Akiko is making the point about poverty effectively being such a, a key risk factor uh, in our uh, mental well-being. And so uh, strategies to directly address issues like poverty, like racism, uh, which we know is uh, directly linked to uh, poor mental health, uh, is I think what's uh, needed. The, the final point I would make is that we need to 
start thinking about a whole life approach. Uh, we don't focus nearly enough on uh, the very start of life, indeed from before the start of life. Uh, the government today has come out with a plan for the first two years, but it appears to be a plan without a price tag attached to it. But actually uh, recognising that uh, our chances in life, our opportunities to flourish, uh, start uh, at what happens to you in your first two years of life. Uh, and the traumas that many children experience uh, in early childhood uh, and seeking to confront those and to seek to prevent uh, trauma happening in childhood uh, seems to me to be a, a good step that we could take uh, to reduce the burden of mental ill health in society. And what is it that has stopped this happening so far? We know, we have known about the uh, the causes of mental ill health for a long time now, and we've known that structural inequality makes things worse. We know about the social determinants of health now. So it's not as if this is these are sort of brand new findings. What's stopped changes being made? H Harry, what would you say? I uh, often quote from Tyson Yankapora's book, um, Sand Talk, where he really outlines the, the notion that violence is distributed, that every society and every system contains violence, um, but it's distributed. So the more privileged we are, the further away we are from the violence. So you kind of think about our technologies, our mobile phones, we love our devices, but actually in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there are people dying um, and whole communities being decimated so that we can benefit. And we don't have to see that. We let companies deal with all of that on our behalf. Um, so I kind of think that's, part of the reason is that because we don't see massive clusters of inequality, it doesn't seem as acute because that violence that is leading to it is so diffuse. So I'm aware whilst I've got the mic that people know I do, um, you know, the work in racism and you know, thank you, uh, Norman, for introducing racism as an aspect of trauma. And I kind of didn't want to say that at the start because I didn't want to be the only person to bring it up. So I'm really appreciative. But what we do know is that the inequalities faced by people of color have been known for at least five decades. And somehow, I think the system perhaps believes that there's something culturally determining it or there's something biologically determining these inequalities. So therefore, though we try and attend to these inequalities, somewhere in the perhaps consciousness, but unconscious, we think, well, this is something about them and no matter what we do, we're never really gonna be able to solve this. And I think, what is required, and I use racism as just one example, what is required is for us to really grasp that link is so inextricable between forms of violence in society, whether it's to do with race or gender or sexual orientation or any aspect of identity and the impacts. I don't think it's clear enough in people's minds. Um, so I think more work on, and I know it's not just about statistics, but you know, enabling people to see it as a causal relationship. It isn't just correlated. And there's been a lot of talk now with the pandemic on building back better and taking this as an opportunity not to just go back to things exactly as they were, but to try to improve things. I wonder whether any of you think that this is, means that this is a time when more radical solutions might be acceptable to people and championed by people that wouldn't have been considered if there hadn't been a pandemic and we didn't get to this stage of saying, maybe let's start again. Um, do, any of you, do any of you want to comment on that? I think there is a chance uh, that we can uh, make the argument now in a way that we perhaps haven't been able to do in the past. I mean, I think part of the problem is that it's quite easy in the first phase of society's uh, sort of growing understanding of mental health. It's quite easy for people to come on board to accept the importance of our focus on mental health and well-being. But the next stage in how we combat it and how we reduce the risk of it happening in the first place is more difficult because it involves political choices. You know, combating poverty, combating racism uh, is difficult. Uh, and some po politicians and political parties uh, shy away from confronting those issues. And of course, it then becomes difficult uh, to convince political parties that these are issues that they should champion uh, because they fear losing votes and so forth. But uh, in a way, the pandemic has 
uh, opened up a whole conversation about how we need to try to build back better. And I think there is at least a chance. I don't have enormous amounts of confidence that we're going to grasp it, but I think there is a chance to at least make the case afresh for a different approach. Are any of you more optimistic that this is the moment where, because of the pandemic, things can be done differently? Catherine. So, so I think school, schools have really come to the fore during this during the pandemic. And I think as everybody has been, all parents have been busy trying to juggle homeschooling, life at home, um, and, and just the whole, the whole piece. And for some, the world of work as well. So the role of schools has really come to the fore. Uh, and I think thinking about children and young, one of the challenges picking up the earlier question is resources seem to always be concentrated on fixing the ill health, the problem that seems the most severe right there and then. And to Harry's point, we really need to push to um, prevention and early intervention and normalizing and recognizing the role that we can all, that parents can play and back to schools that schools can play. So building well-being into the curriculum uh, and really that coming to the fore within the education system and just normalizing, being able to access help and support and listening, I think, is so important. And we know when it comes to um, cultural diversity and children from all cultural backgrounds, we can see within our schools when you normalize uh, mental health support within the school that children will access us. They will access our, our drop-in service, whether they are black, black, British, Asian, uh, white, uh, you know, whatever color creed, they will access it. Won't it always be the case though, Catherine, that uh, you're always, people are always going to prioritize the people that are in crisis at that moment, inevitably at the expense of prevention in the future, because while you still have the people in crisis at that moment, you've got to put your funds in that direction, haven't you? And that's the challenge. Uh, and for those in government, finding the, the you know, making the, the trade-offs within the system, you know, the wider system with a, as a whole. We also know if you can prevent it um, and uh, if you can prevent mental ill health, the savings down the line, um, you know, are enormous. We invest one pound, six pounds, 20 return is something we know from our own work. So somehow figuring out how to shift some investment from somewhere into that preventative piece. I bounced with had... Pfizer on the uh, spreadsheets and all the rest on that. Now we've had, we've had a few questions on the theme of, of poverty and inequality, which was the first theme I wanted to uh, look at. And one speaks to what Norman was saying just now, in fact, which was, um, if it was given the wealth of evidence we have on the impact of health, social and economic policies on mental health, so that this can be translated into policy action, do we need to convince the public before we convince policymakers that poverty matters and that poverty has all these consequences down the line? Is it actually the public who need to be convinced? Akiko, I wonder what you think about that. Um, so I suppose I think for me, one of the issues here is that whilst perhaps decision makers in governments and actually perhaps the general public might agree with some of these causes that poverty can be you know a causal or contributing factor to mental ill health I think the solution to the problem um, will depend on where you sit on the political spectrum and I think a lot of the time in policy we spend our time kind of making the case as to what the problem is and we spend less time perhaps focusing on some of the solutions. So for example, within this conference, perhaps a lot of us might agree that welfare reform, for example, might be one of the solutions. But if you're sitting at the other end of the, um, of the political spectrum, you might think getting more people into work would be the solution to that particular problem. Um, so I think we, we can find ourselves, I think in policy caught between really, really big picture arguments around like the huge societal kind of like transformation that needs to occur. And I think that can actually be quite paralyzing to hear and you can feel quite you know rabbit in the headlights I don't know what to do about this is, this is too big but also I think we can get caught in um ideological other people's ideological arguments um where the parameters are set by others so for example at the moment in the UK in the charity sector we find ourselves lobbying a government which is not interested 
in our arguments. And there's very little we can do to change that at the moment. So personally for me, I suppose I'm more interested in exploring what's actually happening on the ground. So the kind of community building and activism that's happening on the ground, because that's where the energy is and that's where the future is. Um, and I think within that world, I think we're seeing a reframing of some of these questions. And this, has some of that happened as a result of the pandemic? We've certainly seen a lot about communities coming together at this time. Could this be harnessed, do you think, at this moment to improve mental health? I think um, a lot of it was happening before, um, but it was more under the radar. I think there's a little bit more spotlight on it at the moment. I think some of it has come about because of the pandemic. And obviously the move to online has, you know, had, had, has had many challenges, but has enabled, I think, some of this um, to happen. Um, and I, th I think we've just seen, um, you know, through Black Lives Matter, through the kind of the focus that we've seen um, over the past year on racial justice, you know, a huge amount of energy um, around this um, at a grassroots level, which I think is really heartening. So I think if we can listen to what people are doing on the ground and kind of follow that, I think that that gives me a lot more hope, I think, than perhaps some of the, the mental health discourse happening at a, at a kind of high level. Mm. And Norman I think the other thing, sorry, uh, the yeah. other thing Claudia I was just going to say was that, mm. you know, within these circles, we can talk about the fact that we all know uh, that the link between poverty, uh, racism and so forth and, uh, and poor mental health. Uh, but of course, beyond the circles of researchers and people working in the field, there isn't that uh, knowledge or understanding. Uh, and that's not people's fault. But I think it does make the case for us getting out there and, uh, and raising awareness and understanding amongst the public and, and indeed looking to other countries where perhaps they have less unequal societies where the burden of mental ill health is less than it might be uh, in our country. I think the more we can explain and, uh, and justify to the wider public uh, the more pressure you can then put on the politicians, the decision makers, to give this some priority. And isn't it the case though, Norman, that as Akiko said, people will have different political perspectives on this. And it's, it's not the case that anyone thinks poverty is a good idea. It is just that people of different political persuasions have different solutions to it. Yeah, that's right. And Akiko made the point that, you know, there are uh, some may uh, emphasise uh, benefits, some may emphasise the value of work uh, and, and indeed that there is a case for making the case for both. Um, there are many societies that have better funded benefit systems but also uh, higher levels of employment and we know that actually employment is good for your dignity, your sense of self-worth uh, and, and uh, your value in society. So you know I don't think these are either ors, I think they are they are arguments that actually potentially you can make across the political spectrum. And Harry, I wonder how much the um, how the funding for research is spread out comes comes into all this when we look at the disparities that there are by gender or ethnicity. I have interviewed you know several researchers who are looking at or trying to look at the effect, say, of um, experiencing racism during childhood and the effect this can have on mental health in adulthood. Who tell me that it's been very very hard to even get funding for that kind of study. What can be done to try to change the funding priorities? Well, one of the challenges specifically about that point um, of researching racism in people's lives is that often when people think of racism, they focus on the visible and offensive forms of racism. Um, and once you do that, you're focusing on a very small aspect. You know, I think of racism in the plural. It manifests itself, um, racisms in many ways, woven through people's lives and even the social inequalities of which we speak are related to historical and current forms of racism that creates disadvantage. Um, but that's very hard to capture, particularly if your research is you know, focused on, well, can you give me particular episodes of racism? Whereas actually what we're looking at is how it infuses people's existence from the minute they're born. I always say, you know, it's a really uncomfortable exercise, but if you were to offer someone the chance to go pre-birth and offer them two lolly sticks, one black and one white, and say, just on the basis of your chances of success in work, in education, in having good housing, having good relationships, choose one of these, just on those criteria, which would you choose? It's impossible for anyone to say anything other than, and it's really an uncomfortable thing to say, but that's the reality we all know. 
that it just infuses people's lives. And it's hard to capture that in research. So that's one problem. The other is the priority given to randomized controlled trials as a technology, which means that other ways of gathering data um, get missed that has a lot of validity. Um, so I think you know, it's really about understanding those two things as a priority to help move the agenda forward. If you're trying to convince the public and policymakers, will other forms of research that aren't RCTs convince them as much? Well, again, it's about doing what we're doing, changing the narrative, kind of shifting people's expectation as to what science is. So, you know, we often kind of get into this conflict between science and other forms of knowledge and meaning. Um, and, you know, I think we're responsible for shifting people's understanding that actually the thing that we call science is actually going to be partial. Once it involves human beings, there is nothing which is neutral. Um, so we should stop pretending and masquerading science as absolutely neutral and acknowledge that privilege is woven through it. And once we kind of expose that, I think it will be easier to then get to the next stage. And research, while we're on uh, research, uh, Kiko, we've got a question from the audience here where somebody says, uh, based on recent reports, mental health research predominantly based in the global north or in high income countries can contribute to the imbalance of knowledge, expertise and overall pa power. What are your thoughts on creating authentic, concrete steps in decolonizing mental health research or redistrib redistributing power to other low and middle income countries, but without that being tokenism? That's quite a challenge, isn't it? Um, yes, and I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this because I'm not a researcher and um... You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Just, just kind of following on from what you said, Harry. I mean, I look at a lot of research that's produced and I think, well, who commissioned this? Who, who thought this was going to be useful? Um, I think there are huge problems in, in mental health research in terms of the field being really siloed. Um, you know, people not talking to one another. I think really poor kind of like connection with people and communities. And, and just like poor dissemination and you know and you've got examples of like really good practice and like for example mental health um Andre kind of shout out to you if he's tweeting this you know he's disseminating kind of research um, and making it much more accessible so there are good examples of that but a lot of it is it's very siloed it's very white you know and I think I yeah. Yeah, more generally is 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 super white and institutionally racist and that whole sector is really precarious and I you know I think it's um you know I, I, so I think all, all of these, I think all of these issues play out on a global stage, and that's why we have some of these disparities. But I think they also play out um, at a national level as well within research. And what to do about it, I don't know because I don't know how to influence the funders of research. But maybe yeah. someone else might have a better sense yeah. of that. Norman, but there should be th yeah, well, there should be stricter conditions on the funding of research to ensure that the samples are properly representative of society, because. Just as Akiko said, you know, too often it's too white. But you know, uh, at the early stage, in the early stages of COVID, I wrote together with a number of others to the Lancet uh, because some research that had been published sh showed actually that the sampling, the samples that were being used, were completely unrepresentative and missing out absolutely key groups that may well be suffering more than others. So you know the research funding bodies, the public research funding bodies should be imposing really strict requirements on research uh, carried out that they are genuinely representative of society. Catherine, when it comes to research um, on mental health and uh, young people and children, what do you see there that needs to change in order for the right research to have the results that will then make real differences to society or allow people to see what differences need to be made? Well, I think this is a field where there, there's lots more for us to learn. So I'd start with the need to, to, you know, to continue to do more. And it's something that a place to be over, over the 25 plus years. Uh, the development of our work has really been step by step um, informed by what we are learning, front lines in the schools, and then feeding that back in and revisiting, revisiting our practice. Um, I, think, I think there's more to learn about uh, the, the needs of, of children, the whole range of needs that children present, and then specifically which interventions can work and be most effective for which children. So if I take an example of um, conduct disorder and working with children with challenging behavior. We know that this is an issue that 
um, that if it's not addressed, this becomes hugely costly as it goes on into society. A child can become excluded from schools, you enter the criminal justice system, and just the costs begin to spiral. If we can better understand that, um, we know parenting, for example, parenting programs and parenting skills as a way of going about that, um, and then focus some of the resources into addressing that. Um, it's about refining the practice more and more, I think, for all of us who are working in schools to do that and draw on, on learning. But iterative, that's the word I learned throughout this period and digital yeah. developments, things need to be iterative. And we've got um, various uh, questions that had come in on resilience and well-being. Some interesting ones here that I'll be interested to know what, what you uh, make of. Um, Harry, let me put this one to you, but others may way want to pitch in too. This person asks, how can more people live meaningful lives and not just as poorly paid carers for uh, relatives to refresh them and help them feel better valued and part of where they live? Because too many in longer term receipt of welfare benefits have been damaged in the workplace. What can be done so that people's lives can feel more meaningful? Right, so this is kind of radical in response to that question, but so far, a lot of our conversation has been on the people who are at the sharp end, the receiving end of disadvantages um, because of many social ills. We've already established that. And kind of this links back to the idea of research that whilst we continue to focus on those people, we let the others off the hook. Because of course, by definition, if there are people who are disadvantaged, there are people who are advantaged. And one of the things that has happened um, as the pandemic smoked out the termites of discrimination of various forms is that we have shifted some of the dialogue towards saying well what about the oppressors I mean it's a strong word but what about those people what about whiteness what about um the privileged um you know the, the middle class and the aspiring middle classes who have wealth and who have lifestyles that have an impact on others so in answer to that question I think yes there are things we can kind of do to support people with their own resilience but the biggest shift will be when we start to move the rest of society into reflecting on the things that it takes for granted because in order for us to kind of get the balance to be shifted we will you and I will have to relinquish some of those things which are our norms and we like and we've come to assume them as right we have come to assume if I want to have three holidays and I've worked hard for it that I can fly anywhere I like because I've worked hard and I deserve it we do that at the cost of black and brown people in the south of the globe as we wreck the environment. That's what I meant about diffuse violence. So we can kind of make that more localized, but it is about all of us taking account of what we're doing to contribute to inequalities. Just the very word resilience uh, blame things again on the individual. I noticed there was one comment saying, why should children be expected to even develop resilience and, and be resilient? Uh, Catherine. Um, well, I, I think about well, well-being. I think that's a good point. Um, why should we have to think about it? You know, school should be a place where children can, in, you know, can engage in learning, can, um, can, can engage positively. Um, and we need to change the environment within the school. So that's just part of how it is, rather than, you know, in some cases, a huge focus on academic outcomes. It's part of growing up the whole child with creativity, with, you know, enjoyment and engagement in physical activity and sport, whatever it is that, you know, so a child can be the best they can be with the strengths that they have. And are you trying to teach children to deal with life's adversities better? Because some of those adversities will come along, whatever, however society changes. I think, so one of the key things that we do is, is um, helping a child to be able to ask for help, recognize when they might need a little bit of help and to be able to ask openly for that. So we run a service called Place to Talk, on average a third of children in a primary school. So this is from the teeny tinies right up to you know, 11, 12 years of age. On average, a third of children will access that in any one year. It's just a 15 minute session um, they can, and they'll come with issues around friendships, or it might be bullying, or they want to share a concern from home. But that's totally normalized. And as I say, by children from whichever culture, and they'll come individually or in small groups, and then work out a solution. 
And I have to say, one of the most stunning things I saw was in one of our schools in South London, where children role played, place to talk um, at, a, at a, a showcase event. And to hear the children asking those questions, it would just really demonstrate how, how they can, you know, how you can learn those behaviors and how, you know, and then children grow up with that ability. Uh, Catherine, don't, don't we sometimes make the mistake that we sort of create a false choice between, you know, the pursuit of academic excellence and the sort of more sophisticated approach to supporting children that you've described? Because it always seems to me that if you, approach, if you pursue a more sophisticated approach in understanding behaviour, for example, uh, which may well be, uh, you know, related to the experiences that ch children have gone through uh, outside school, if we pursue that more sophisticated approach, we actually facilitate learning and the pursuit of excellence for children who are otherwise dumped out of the system and horribly discarded. Absolutely. And we know, again, we know uh, from, from the evidence, from the data, that when we support children, they engage better in learning. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and then in turn, you know, that delivers the academic, well, yeah. the academic outcomes and development and growth of the whole child. Um, so absolutely, yes. And a teacher's understanding what, what lies behind behavior and seeing that as a mechanism of how children communicate is, is so crucial. I think one of the most appalling things that we do in our society is uh, exclude so many children from school uh, as a result of behaviours that may well be related to their life experiences. So we sort of punish children for what they've been through. Uh, and of course the outcomes then once some, a child has been excluded from school are pretty disastrous, particularly for that child in terms of their life chances. But the cost to society of the neglect of that child is incalculable. So we need a smarter approach to how we deal with behaviour, as Catherine says. And I wonder, uh, Akiko, since your, your area is very much um, uh, service users, survivors, being whatever people would like, term people would like to use, being involved in research, do you ever see this, do you see much of this now in research with children and, and young people, that there is more of an attempt to include people? Um, I think it's a it, it's a really kind of contested area. This um, so so. I think having I've worked outside of the UK, and I think what's really really interesting um, in, in my experience is that a lot of countries um, in um, in the EU, not all, but some of them, look to the UK as um, a, as a kind of like beacon of like progressive thinking in this particular area, and. Um, and I think that within the UK, I think we're far more kind of like critical as we should be of how good we are at um, involvement and participation and lived experience leadership seen more broadly. So I think specifically within research, I think um, so there are very, very few survivor researchers. I think it's a really, really precarious area to, um, to be working in. I, I think there's, um, I think, when that overlaps with children and young people mental health research, that's even trickier. Um, so it, it's an area which is incredibly precarious, really, really underfunded, and where I'd like to see a lot more resource. I think survivor research is just one aspect of it. There's a little bit more around um, peer research and, um, and, and other areas around it, but more broadly, I would say that participation and involvement in mental health research isn't great. But then when you speak to people outside of mental health, so for example, in wider health, they'll say it's better in mental health than it is in other areas, which isn't, I'm not, so I don't think that lets anyone off the hook, but I think it's interesting that it's a mixed, it's a mixed field. Yeah. And we have a couple more uh, questions on uh, well-being. Here's an interesting one. Um, I don't know whether this is one any of you have thought about uh, very much, which is how one big thing that could be done is having a four day working week, as is being suggested in Spain. How might that affect mental well-being? Could that make a big difference in the UK? Um, who like to who like who has a thought about uh, four day weeks. Would well, like I, I, look, I, I think we should absolutely be exploring uh, new ways of working, uh, including not just shorter working hours, because if you look at the long term trends, you know, we've gone from working far longer hours in, in Victorian times to a much shorter week now, but we've sort of stalled 
for the last uh, 20 years or so in the UK and in, and, and in the US. And uh, there are other countries who I think are ahead of us on that, but also in terms of flexible working. And, you know, the uh, pandemic has demonstrated to us that we can function uh, in different ways. And if we can accommodate uh, people's caring needs, both for older people and for children uh, into their working life, then we can relieve stress levels in many households, I think very significantly. So I think we could be much smarter in terms of work. And uh, if we look at a future world in which uh, the, uh, the, 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 the totality of work may be less than it is now because of automation, then sharing it more equitably, I think is also an important debate to be pursued. Yes, because Harry, isn't that going to be the difficulty that a four day working week might be a luxury that would work for some people, but it depends what what um, a privilege you have in the first place. Well, no, indeed. And, um, you know, at the heart of this is the way in which we conceptualise success. So a lot of what I'm kind of talking about is how we change our views as to what norms are. Um, so even people who are in poverty are still being fed the notion that, you know, what you should aspire to is wealth and wealth is measured by your ability to acquire things. Um, so if we shifted that as we shift the narrative and we start to place more value on relationships and communities, then of course we could redistribute wealth um, you know, in organizations and some of those um, you know, discussions about changing the um, value between the top pay and those further in the organization. We can kind of get into more of those conversations because there wouldn't be this desire to be accumulating so much. So I kind of think that's um, you know, probably at the heart of it, but it does come back to our view as to what success is. Um, which needs to be reshaped. And coming back to what policies we might want to, um, might you know, might want to um, change to improve mental health in the future. Uh, here's a, a question from somebody saying: It increasingly seems that some societal problems with societal causes are side sidestepped by treating the consequences of these problems as individually determined by our individual mental health, um, which was touched on earlier. And they ask: How do you think we can push back against this individualization and diminish the stigma that comes along that when we know how multifaceted? it is um who'd like to take that akiko what what can we do to change that stigma oh um so that was a really complex question with so many different elements to it so i, I got a bit lost and I, I suppose i was um i was thinking about stigma and how actually it, it's really tricky isn't it because i think um you know, I, you know, we are where we are in terms of the mental health landscape in, in the UK and the, the campaigns of the last, the anti-stigma campaigns of the last 10 years have made a difference and they have improved things in some ways. But I think that there's this constant focus on, on, on stigma and we, we talk about stigma instead of discrimination, for example, or stigma instead of inequality. And I think that that's part of the, um, you know, that the focus on the kind of the individual rather than kind of the, the wider kind of like shift that we need. So I haven't really answered the question because mm. I got distracted by that particular yeah, word. But, and so I wonder, I mean, I wonder, Catherine, if, if it sounds as if what you have managed to do in schools is to make it so that any child feels they can go and talk about their difficulties. But are they st do they still get then put within the individual rather than the situation in society that might have brought them to the stage that they're at? So uh, yeah, I would take it right back to children, because if you can get into if you get into day-to-day um, -day life, which is what it is for children in schools, that's before you start segmenting problems, if you like. So if uh, if a, a child has good relationships with their parents, getting in early before a mental a mental ill health or mental health problem arises. So a really solid, great relationship with their parents. That, in terms of policy terms, what are we doing around parenting? Parenting skills, parenting, parenting programs, um, support in the early years to give the child a good foundation in life. Um, then within teacher education, what are we doing around um, a teacher's understanding of child development in initial teacher training? Again, it's normalized. It's not about, ident it's not about mental health problems. It is about development of a whole child and a healthy and understanding how a child develops. Um, and so if you get in at that level, um, it's, it's before you end up segmenting down into the individual problems that occur later on. 
And Harry, what about once people are adults, how do we stop it being so that their mental health difficulties are made feel as if they're being blamed on them as an individual when we know how many other things are at play? What can actually be done in practice to stop that? Well, I think that the... Um... This feels like bookending the conference because we started talking about trauma, that still in the public mind, trauma is one cataclysmic event um, and people recognise that but don't understand the diffuse nature of trauma. Um, And I often ask, what do you think it is you're seeing? So in our profession, most of the people online, if they see someone who's street homeless, who's addicted to substances and you walk past, you see the evidence of trauma and you can frame it as such. That's what you see. For many people in the public, they see someone who's chosen to do this. I didn't take drugs, you know, I took it once and I stopped. Look, they chose to do this and it's individualized. So I think spreading the knowledge about trauma, what it means and how it shows up in people's lives is going to be the big key because then we'll start to change the dialogue in society and then people's preparedness to be more of a community that engages with the challenges in people's lives rather than blaming it on the individual. And then and there, can... are some, there are some good things happening, incidentally, Claudia, because mm. on Monday I spoke at a conference uh, for West Yorkshire and Harrogate, and the whole of their health system is working alongside police and education and social services, local authorities, to uh, uh, understand the importance of trauma. Uh, uh, and the impact that it has uh, on society. And that whole system sort of approach, uh, I think is very impressive. It's too early to say whether they will see it through to positive conclusions for that population, but getting that conversation going, uh, I think is really enlightened. And I would encourage other parts of the country to do the same thing. Yeah, that sounds like an impressive joining up of things there. Now, we have um, uh, an audience member's question here that has multiple parts, all of which are are interesting questions, actually. So I'm going to put one of these questions to each of you, because there's at least four questions in here, but they're all slightly different. Um, And uh, Catherine, let me start with you, because I think this is one that could apply to children. How can we cultivate kinder and more accommodating cultures? I'm guessing that is something you could start at school. Uh, absolutely. Um, well, I'm even thinking about uh, we run Children's Mental Health Week. So each year uh, with a focus and actually one one year we had kindness as the theme that ran throughout. Uh, and again, just as a way of promoting, promoting that, promoting behaviours around that. It was phenomenal to see, um, you know, what happens in the schools right around the country. Um, even this year for Children's Mental Health Week, I still have in my mind image of a little girl wearing a, a rainbow um, and just the kind of the joy of, of that in her dress to express being the theme. So I think promoting that within the school system, um, absolutely. And, uh, and this is, this is, uh, uh, this is, all these questions are from, from a young person who also says, how do we shift the focus from description um, just just describing what's going on and highlight that expertise is not enough. Akiko, I think that that's interesting, that that idea of highlighting that expertise is not all of it. Yeah, or perhaps redefining what, what expertise is and what knowledge is and who produces it. Um, you know, really, really interesting question. I think there's a huge amount happening, um, but it's not necessarily where we're looking. So, and there's a huge amount happening that's being led by young people. So I would say let, let's kind of shift our attention to, to what is happening. Mm. And Harry, they also say, how do we as mental health advocates push for actual on the ground work, which involves engagement and participation? And how do we collaborate to establish accountable and effective context sensitive intersectional work? That's a big question. Yeah, I quite like the idea of on the ground. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, moving things out of a system with like a silo of interventions to understanding that um, there are community-based activities. So I um, was part of a research group in Jamaica um, when they were talking about closing some of their wards um, in Bellevue Hospital. And what they did was to go before they did that to the communities where people lived and had conversations with consent 
with the communities to say, well, actually what it means is that you're going to have someone locally who sometimes will have highs and sometimes will have lows, sometimes will have troubles. Mm -hmm. And do we kind of sign up to being a community that holds that? Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you know, there's not the kind of wealth in Jamaica in the same way there is here, but to kind of invest in communities so that people know who to call, where the expertise is, to kind of create care, a bit like we did with, um, you know, dementia friendly um, or yeah. dementia where, communities just really investing in that kind of work I think is important and it will be a journey sometimes it will work really well and occasionally it won't but we just need to kind of stick with it and move away from doing an initiative for three or five years and expecting it to just deliver when actually what we're doing is trying to shift cultures as well as the fabric of communities yeah so we need to be looking really really long term yes in that case and their fourth question um i'm impressed with the number of questions this person had how do young people this is for you norman this one how do young people like me contribute to this shift in a whole culture about mental health without having enough expertise or degrees yet can young people join in young people have to join in and we have to ensure that it happens uh so often Uh, oh, I think things are done too, sorry so so often things are done to young people without mm. hearing their voice and uh, I think increasingly we're, we're beginning to understand that if we're to uh, change the way services behave uh, we have to listen to the users of that service but we're still not good enough at it yet um, we in South London uh, as part of my work at, at the Maudsley we've engaged in a whole exercise, a sort of public mental health approach, uh, listening to, the, to, to people in South London, hearing what they see as the challenges, for example, on COVID. And, and as we emerge from COVID, what are the priorities for our communities? And, and we're taking a very different approach to what has historically been done. We started by going out and listening to people uh, and, and including young people. And on the back of that, we will start to build our response rather than us assuming that we know best. And that is the sort of mindset, I think, that has to change. Yeah. And that answers a question a couple of people asked of about how how can we make it so that people's views on the ground get taken more seriously and get get taken into account, which all, all fits in there. Um, We've got just a few minutes left. So finally, I would like to ask each of you to think realistically and, to, and feel free to be frank here. What do you think will happen next in this space? Are we going to see some changes or not? Uh, who'd like to start? Catherine. Well, I hope we are going to see some changes. I think, uh, and there are some things moving in the world of children's mental health. So the green paper that the government had, the mental health support teams. So there are some wheels beginning to move. Um, I just think we need to keep pushing and make sure that they they are when they are implemented it is in the way that we want to see them implemented on the ground that they don't become mm. just a bit tick boxy that they really make mm. the difference on the ground mm. that's an interesting point uh harry We've seen um, through history that changes um, have often occurred when there have been forms of activism of many sorts. And I think as we develop things like the movement for social approaches in mental health that I'm a part of developing, um, that we'll get collective voices leaning into institutions with legacies like the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Um, there's so much power. Um, you kind of think about the framing of the Mental Health Act and the structures of our systems, they're still designed around medicine. So in order for us to get massive movement, we need for some relinquishing of that power and reflecting on what is knowledge and all of that we've explored. Um, and it will be through collective action. Um, as I say, with social movements that you know might publish papers, hold conferences, shift the debate. So um, I'm optimistic that we will see progress because already, we've seen the Royal College reflecting on some of the things that have been taken um, for granted around you know, the strength of diagnosis or racism in psychiatry, so forth. We're seeing movement on that and it will continue whilst we push. And Norman, what do you think will happen next in this space? Well, I'm 
optimistic in the sense that I think there are opportunities. And what I would say is that I think it's up to us all to take responsibility uh, for this. So at the South London and Maudsley, we've chosen to, uh, to, to sort of shape a new vision for our organization where we explicitly will say that we must be an anti-racist organization. No, I don't think any NHS organization has come out and said that before, but I think we have to say it clearly, expressly, that we have a special We've lost Norman for a second, but last time he just reappeared. Ah, oh, yeah. he has, he's yeah, reappeared. Let me, just, let, me, let me finish my point. Mm. That, sorry, that we have a special responsibility to combat it uh, and that uh, we must uh, confront it. Uh, uh, also equally, uh, that uh, we have to engage uh, the people who use our services uh, in uh, the uh, service that they receive. So. I think by organisations uh, being willing to confront it, expressly stating that we must abide by people's human rights, that we should treat every person equally, then we can make a difference. But it's no good us just talking about it. We have to actually do it. Well, we're very interesting to see what, what does happen on, on the ground in the end. And uh, Akiko, are you, are you optimistic or, or not? What do you think will happen next? A little bit of both. Um, I think when I'm in kind of policy settings, um, more and more I feel that what I hear is really out of touch and disconnected. Um, I think all the energy is um, coming from grassroots groups, you know, led by lived experience groups like Mad COVID, um, Make Space, Taraki, just a couple of examples there. And I think that's what that's what we're going to see shift as though as the energy from those spaces takes over, and what and that, that, that the discourse that we see in policy settings just feels more and more um, out of touch. Perhaps we'll see a generational shift in how we look at this. Well, we shall all wait to see what happens and, and to see what all of you can make happen as well. So um, thank you so much to everyone on our panel, to um, Akiko and Harry and Catherine and Norman. And uh, somebody's just um, summed it up really nicely with a, a comment there saying, what a fantastic panel. So um, they've, got me the words for me there so thank you all very much and thank you everyone for your questions as well and it'll be very interesting to see what happens let me hand you back to Craig thank you very much Claudia and and absolutely I think fantastic panel just perfectly sums it up um what what a wonderful way to end um and to draw the conference to a close um